Hey booktube, it's Angie. It's uh, me sitting here, or standing here, trying to get caught up on a few videos. So uh, you may see in upcoming weeks um, some mix of uh, new topics I never mentioned I was going to film and then some old stuff that I either have had on my desktop needing to be edited that I told you guys I was trying to get caught up on and just some videos that I told you I needed to film and just for whatever reason struggled to get there <laughs> and um, here lately I've been uh, having some trouble sleeping and, and um, having issues with like uh, pain in my limbs and stuff so uh, it's it's been hard uh, as far as like energy wise to get up and film but I'm feeling pretty good today so I want to go ahead and at least knock something out as far as filming and then um, hopefully get one or two edited today on top of that so we can get the ball rolling again. Today I want to talk about The Beguiled, finally. <laughs> um, I watched, I read the book and read, watched the movie a while back and told you guys I was going to share my thoughts at some point and here we are. <laughs> uh, I finally feel ready to uh, to stand up and um, not necessarily like proclaim anything, but just like stand up and get the video done. So uh, this is probably the cover you're used to seeing. Um, it came out a while back. I forget when it originally came out. It's just, it got a resurgence. Uh, well, I mean, the first movie version of this came out in the 70s, so I imagine it dates back at least that far. Oh, okay. I think it says it. 1966 it looks like he first wrote it yeah 1966 was when this was first published uh it went on to have a movie adaptation in the 70s by clint eastwood which i'll talk about in a minute and then uh later in 2017 <laughs> i was like 2007 no it was more recent than that 2017 sofia coppola came out with uh her movie version of it so plot wise what are we looking at uh, Plot-wise, this involves Union Army Corporal uh, John Patrick McBurney. Uh, he's around 19, 20, that age, uh, and he's found wounded, pretty much half dead, in the Virginia woods <laughs> by this 13-year-old Amelia, who is uh, a student at uh, Margaret, Margaret, Martha, Martha Farnsworth Seminary for Young Ladies. I had to write all that down because it's kind of long. Uh, so she's a student there. It's kind of like a boarding school. And she's out in the woods picking mushrooms. She's not technically supposed to be out in the woods, but Martha, the schoolmaster, is away. <laughs> so rules are kind of relaxed. And then when Martha comes back into town, everybody's like, oh, sorry, I forgot. You know how I am. Because uh, one of the things that plays into this story is that these girls, they don't get a lot of outside time with... Uh, society. The Civil War is going on when this story is taking place and the school itself is kind of set back into the country. Uh, the school originated as the Farnsworth estate. Martha and her sister, uh, what was her sister's name? Harriet. I think Harriet was the sister's name. Uh, it was their childhood home but there's a part in the book that explains that um, there was a period in the Farnsworth family finances where uh, the dad, he just kind of wanted to chill on the porch and read and play cards. He didn't really develop the land as much as he should to keep the finances going. So the land itself kind of went to crap and then uh, Martha's brother got into a gambling problem and that burned up more of the finances. So in order to save the house, Martha comes up with this idea to turn it into a ladies boarding school. So that's where all these ladies are, but during the war Martha is really particular about keeping them away from soldiers naturally, uh, unless you know they have to talk to them. But she also keeps them away from a lot of society. They're basically just isolated amongst themselves on this estate. Martha doesn't really take them into town with her anytime when she goes to get supplies or anything. They just have to stay right there. So. When anybody comes by, uh, naturally, they're going to be like, oh my god, company! <laughs> so that's kind of what happens with Amelia when she's out in the woods and she finds 
uh, John McBurney. Um, he's extremely wounded and, you know, she's about 13 at this age and she's very um, innocent hearted and so she just, she doesn't look at like, she sees a man in uniform but she doesn't look at like one side or the other, she just sees a man wounded. So she said, oh my god, we have to get you to the school to help you. And so that's kind of how all of this starts, is Amelia decides she needs to take John McBurney back to the school to have him tended to. But there was an understanding at the school, um, between the school and the uh, Confederate Army, that if you were to find an enemy soldier, you were supposed to tie um, some sort of rag or silk or something on the fence and let them know, and they would come and take the, prison, take the soldiers as like a prisoner of war. So when <laughs> Amelia convinces John to come back to the school, um, everybody is really excited because there's, a, you know, John's a young guy and there's, the school is full of teenage girls. And so all of them are a little bit swoony right off the bat, or at least curious. And then there is Maddie, who, uh, Maddie is one of the last uh, former slaves by that that were owned by the Farnsworth family prior to the war. She stayed on with the family and now she works as sort of the catch-all housekeeper cook position in the house. As soon as she sees John, she's like, oh no, <laughs> nothing good is going to come of this. I can already tell this is going to be a mess. But she keeps quiet because she's kind of curious to see where this goes and um, what what this turns into. But yeah, from the very start, she has her suspicions that this is going to go bad. So bad. At the beginning of the story, Martha is out on a supply run getting stuff for the house. And eventually she brings the cart back and everybody informs her about the new guest in the parlor laying out on the chaise because he's... I think he got... I forget what his actual wound was. I think he got shot in the leg or something like that. But he's pretty much immobile for a good part of the first part of the story. They just hole him up in the parlor and tend to him the best they can. There's no doctor around to help so it turns out that <laughs> um, I think Martha and I think Maddie helps maybe in that scene. Uh, but it's mainly Martha goes in there and cleans the wounds and tends to them and uh, tries to get him back on his feet and the whole time she's trying to decide what she's going to do with him once he gets better. Does she turn him in? Does she let him go? She hasn't fully decided. In that process of him getting better, much of the story is all of these teenage ladies <laughs> trying to sneak into the parlor where he's laid out and basically trying to win his heart, impress him. And uh, John's, he's kind of impressed with it. Uh, John, the way he's described in the book, if you've seen at least the Sofia Coppola movie, I'm just going to tell you right now, the way John McBurney is described in the book does not match what Colin Farrell looks like. I'm not mad about it. I'm never mad when Colin Farrell's cast in anything. But in the book, John McBurney is described as your typical Irish ginger because <laughs> he is uh, explained as being an Irishman who... Uh, relocated to the U.S. So he did start out as a true Irishman in the story um, when he was a kid and then moved to the States uh, somewhere in his adulthood. But he's described as a typical Irish ginger, red hair, pale skin, a lot of freckles. Uh, not immediately always the, the look that a lot of women gravitate to as far as um, what they find immediately attractive when compared to a dark Irishman. <laughs> um, not saying that they don't have an audience, but it's a little bit harder for them. I think that's been pretty commonly established that gingers have it a little bit harder finding people that, that find them attractive. So when he has a whole house full of ladies that are like, ooh, <laughs> he kind of eats it up a little bit and he plays them all against each other and makes them all feel like they've all won his heart at different times because they're never in the room at the same time. So anytime one of them comes in, he can be like, oh yeah, I'm starting to feel things for you. Oh no, you're really special. And he even, I think at one point goes after Harriet. And <laughs> um, it just, it turns into an emotional mess in the house because all of these little things, these 
little disagreements that happen between the girls, uh, little petty things and um, just old, old grievances and things like that, they all heighten when McBurney's presence comes in because all of these girls truly want to win him and so they all start going at each other and things that started out as like minor annoyances among roommates basically turns into examples of just really intense um, just cruelty and meanness and blackmail and Edwina is one of the worst in the story. She has no shame <laughs> about screwing people over if it means she's going to be the victor in the end. So that's a lot of the story is just who is going to win him eventually. Uh, the the dark element of the story doesn't come in until much later, closer to the end of the book, where all of this stuff that's been building and building and building eventually comes to a head and we get like the dramatic scene, the dark scene of um, when all these all this plotting among the ladies just goes over the top into full-on crazyhood. The problem is this book is incredibly slow. So even when you get to that point, you're, you're almost not aware <laughs> that that's what's going on because it, for the intensity spike there that I'm talking about, it's not really that intense. It's always, it's, it's more like, oh wait, I think, I think something different is happening here. Uh, it, it's more like, uh, just like a little blip of, oh, there's, there's a little bit of backstabbing going on. Uh, but it's it's really minor and the book overall is just so slow. Uh, I mean if if you're really into really slow books with very slow conversations this could be for you. Uh, I personally was not a huge fan of this book. It took me freaking forever to get to the end of it and it's not even that long. Like it's just a normal sized book but it's just one of those books that was just a chore for me to make progress in because there just wasn't enough there for me as the reader to like push the story along. But I will say uh, there are a couple moments in this book where they have some pretty important conversations that at least that made me feel like it was worth reading. There's one point where uh, Maddie, the housekeeper, is talking about the um, suspicion she has that Edwina is mixed race and what that'll mean for her. And then there's also, you know, because it's during the Civil War, so um, a lot of uh, race discussion is thrown into the, the conversation at different points. The one that stood out to me, though, that, uh, that I thought I would share is this discussion that happens between, um, it's between John and is it Martha or Harriet? I forget now. But basically it's John and one of the ladies talking and uh, they're having this discussion about family servants and everything and the lady makes a comment that, uh, oh well we, we treat the blacks just like family so I don't know what they're upset about. And John's kind of like, do you though? Do you really treat them like family? She's like, well yeah, of course, we're great to them. And the things that John brings up I think are definitely worth um, thinking about when you when you read this book because um, he does he does make a good point I'm sorry I can't remember it it'll probably hit me while I'm reading this I can't remember who he's talking to in this story um, at this particular point but they're talking about um, how they uh, started uh, how he how he ended up in the war and he, she says um, you joined the army for just the adventure of it and he responds mostly I guess of course, a very good line was handed to me by the recruiting officer, a smooth, talking, oily sort, who told me that you were torturing and mistreating all the blacks down here. Well, that is a vicious lie, I told him angrily. Well, it would seem so, he said, from the evidence I've seen. This Maddie woman you have here seems treated well enough. Well, of course she is, and so are most of the others. Why, the darkies on our place in South Carolina are just like members of our own family. You mean they're related to you? No, not that, of course. I just mean that they're treated as well as any of us. You don't intermarry with them, though. Well, no, of course not. But now, I did hear somewhere, though, that people in south of, 
people in the South are of mixed color, that they have black blood in them. Well, I guess there's a certain amount of that sort of thing among the lower classes, I admitted, but most of our people of both colors are every bit as respectable as anywhere else. Oh, I know that. You don't need to convince me on that score. Well, I just say that it's just the story of the war itself I didn't know before. Otherwise, I can tell you I would have set sail for Charleston instead of New York. I don't think you would have made it, I informed him. Charleston is blockaded now, and it's very difficult for any ships to get into the port. However, if you're really thinking of seriously changing your allegiance, I'm sure it can be arranged. I've only to send a letter off to my father, and I'm sure he would take care of it immediately. Okay, I think he's talking to a Duina. Uh, I think that's what's going on here. Now that it's like coming back to my memory. Oh, that's very kind of you, miss, he said. And he honestly did look as though he's, he was appreciative. I may just accept your offer once this leg of mine is healed. I could write my father now and your leg would be healing while we were waiting for his reply. Oh, that's so, isn't it? Well, let me give the whole matter a good thinking over. It's not a nice thing, you know, to be a turncoat, although I guess a person is allowed one honest mistake in a lifetime. However, I'd still like to study the proposition very carefully. You'll understand that, don't you, miss? Yes, certainly I understand it, and I think it's wise. Also, I'm glad you mentioned the word turncoat. I wouldn't care for a turncoat either, it's, but as you say, an honest mistake can't be helped. Ah, grand, we're in agreement then. And just as soon as I thought the whole thing out, that ought to be as soon as the pain in the leg eases and my mind clears, I'll send you off to your pen and ink to compose the letter, nice letter to Dad, offering him my humble services for what they're worth. All right, miss? All right. Good enough. But now let's get back to what we were discussing before. What about all these people of mixed color? Are they accepted as white people? Well, no. Never? I mean in cases where they might have had only a little bit of black blood. Say only a quarter or an eighth or maybe even less. They're still considered black. But you don't mistreat them. Well, certainly not. Those mongrel people are very highly prized as house servants, chambermaids, and butlers, and so forth. I see, I see. The Yankees are the only ones guilty of mistreating people, although I'm sure that I've never told you anything about that. The way they've burned homes and stolen Negroes and cattle and brutalized women and children here in Virginia and their cavalry raids in Westmoreland County and other places as well. Hanging wouldn't be good enough for fellas that would do a thing like that. Well, I'm sure Miss Martha and Miss Harriet will be glad to know you feel that way. How do you feel about me now? No better than I did before, I guess. You know, I said to myself yesterday when I came into this house, that rosy-cheeked one is the leader there. She's the one you gotta sell. I, I, I did like that scene where McBurney was kind of like, uh-huh, you don't, you don't see what you're saying. Uh -huh. um, so, I don't know, like, with, with the character of McBurney, I feel like, if I'm being honest, he was a little bit of a shit <laughs> when he got all these women pitting against each other for him. Um, but... As a whole, I think what ends up happening to him later in the story is is not really fair for the crime he committed. I feel like it's more he was in he was being stupid, he was being immature, and he was in the wrong place at the wrong time with a house full of fired up women. <laughs> uh, is kind of how I felt towards the end. But overall, the story was really slow, um, so I was I was kind of curious to see how the movies turned out. Because I'll just tell you right now, uh, I one of the reasons I do this um, book to movie section is I am not one of those readers that says the book is always better. I think that's a very immature, uh, shallow <laughs> opinion to have that the book is always better. Because it's not. It's no, no. I read hundreds of books a year. I can tell you there are a lot of books that have been turned into movies where the movies brought so much that the book couldn't even touch. Um, there are also plenty of books where their movie equivalents were disrespectful and sad <laughs> um, to how amazing the book was. But I'm just saying there are plenty of books out there that were just all right or just flat out crap that somehow the movie version that the people that write the script, they see something else there that the author didn't give you that they give you in the movie form and it turns out amazing. Like that does happen. So I was kind of curious to see if that would be the case with the, the movie versions. And it didn't really work out that way either. <laughs> uh, so I started with the 2017 version. Because uh, at the time when I started this, that was the one I knew about was from Sofia Coppola. And uh, when I was reading this book and I was talking about it, 
uh, <laughs> every so often when I talk to the when I talk about these book to movie ones, Barry gets a little bit into it. Uh, he's not a big fiction reader himself, but sometimes when I talk about a book that has a movie version, he'll say, eh, "I think I want to watch that with you." And this was one of the ones where he agreed to to watch the movie because he does like historical based movies. So he thought he would give it a try with me, and it was, uh, it was entertaining uh, the first time around. And he did watch the follow-up. Since he watched the 2017 version with me, he did watch the Clint Eastwood follow-up with me. And that experience turned out to be even funnier. <laughs> but yeah, starting with the 2017 one, uh, some of the changes that they moved around from the book to the movie. Um, I mentioned that the movie or the book starts with Martha in town and she has to come back and find John. In the movie it opens up with Martha uh, tending to a corn patch uh, at, uh, in the garden at the at the school. And it was funny when they first panned to that scene because you know Barry he's he's a country boy a mountain boy through and through and he's watching and he's like She's working awfully hard for feed grain. <laughs> and I was like, what are you talking about? And he's like, that's feed corn. Nobody's going to eat that. <laughs> it's like, he's just, that's why it's kind of hard to watch movies with him because he's very detail oriented. Um, but it also makes it fun because he'll just say stuff like that. We're like, why are you working so hard? That's feed corn. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's, that's where it starts. Um, and uh, I mentioned how... Uh, the look of John is different now. They switched it from Ginger Irishman to Dark Irishman when they cast uh, Colin Farrell. Um, Kidman, the, Nicole Kidman, the way she plays Martha is a little bit calmer, at least how I pictured Martha in the story. I feel like Kidman brought a calmness to Martha that wasn't quite there. I mean, Martha's not like an out-and-out -out wild character, but when I was thinking about it, it could have just been the way Nicole Kidman tends to act most of her characters. She has that sort of calm demeanor, low voice type of thing that she brings to most of her roles. So I might have just been seeing that. Uh, I noted uh, I couldn't find Harriet. <laughs> Nobody mentioned Harriet. So I was like, what happened to the sister? Um, and then it seems like in the movie version, Edwina was given some of Harriet's traits. Uh, the whole thing about the mixed race topic, that was completely dropped from the movie because I think Edwina in the movie is played by a blonde. Um, so that whole topic was was dropped from the from this script. And then it also seemed like Alicia was given, she's another girl that I didn't really give a lot of mention to, but Alicia is I think she was the one that was treated sort of like the bastard <laughs> stepchild um, uh, student at the school because most of the girls that are at the school, their parents come from money. Um, and that was one of the driving forces of starting the school is, is uh, Martha was saying she could get a lot of people with money to send their girls here to be safe during the war. Well, Alicia, she's kind of like the charity case in the school. She's just there, uh, her parents are not from money, so <laughs> she has this um, room on the third floor that's sort of described as like this Harry Potter-like closet <laughs> type room on the third floor when everybody else has like big old rooms. Uh, I think in the movie version I noticed some of the characteristics that were mentioned in Edwina in the book were given to Alicia in the movie. So like character personality things were, were moved around a little bit. I also mentioned that uh, the pace of the book is very slow. The pace of the movie is especially slow and it's freaking dark. <laughs> like not just, uh, you know, they shot it at night. The entire movie is dark to the point where it's a pain in the ass to even watch the movie to even see anything going on at any point because you're like, where, even when they go outside, it just looks like it's dark everywhere. Uh, and I'll try to find, I did save some clips I think <coughs> of watching that movie, that version of the movie, so I'll try to show some examples or try to find some pictures, a still shot so you can see what I'm talking about.
But yeah, that was one of the things we were struggling with the most is that even Barry's like, I can't see shit. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the plot is very slow. The set is dark. Uh, we were thinking that like maybe Sophia was Coppola was trying to do something where she's like, oh, I'm going to be very period authentic and I'm only going to use candlelight or something like that. But they had lamps back then that dispersed light pretty well. <laughs> it's like you had to use multiples of them maybe, but you could have gotten a decent amount of light and still been historically accurate. It's okay. Uh, so yeah, I don't know what that was about. But um, yeah, I said the plot was slow. Uh, I marked <laughs> one hour 13 minute through one hour 33 minute mark action. <laughs> but then it died off again. Uh, and then the ending was switched up a little bit. So yeah, it was hard to make a, a really strong opinion about the movie or how the plot went and everything because of like all the little details. I just didn't think it was shot that well. <laughs> uh, and yeah, it didn't really bring that much for me. So I found out about the Eastwood version and I was kind of surprised because like I've seen a lot of Eastwood's movies from like the early 60s on and uh, I had never heard of it, him doing this this movie before. The way I found out about it was I read Crazy Heart by Thomas Cobb, which that's another book to movie video that should be coming up after this one uh, where I'll explain that. But there's a scene in there where um, the main character is uh, hanging out in his hotel room one night and he's talking about watching this movie on TV in the hotel room and he's describing it and he doesn't say it by name but he's just describing the scene and I was like yeah that sounds like beguiled but then he mentions Eastwood and I was like well Eastwood wasn't in that movie and so I went and looked it up and sure enough found that there was a 1970s version with Eastwood done it's one of those ones that he kind of did in his career and then quietly tried to get people to forget about because it was kind of a bomb at the theater um it didn't didn't do a lot for his career. So yeah, that one. Um, <laughs> who? That one. Uh, trying to just figure out how to explain this. That one, just in short, when Barry and I watched it, it made us feel dirty. <laughs> and we are not shy, uh, prude people, but that one was a little too close to gross 70s softcore <laughs> that uh, we were just really uncomfortable through a lot of it. Uh, yeah, there's, um, because it's the 70s, prepare yourself for seeing a lot of misty uh, shot choreography and interludes and that screechy intermental, intermental? instrumental stuff they like to use in 70s movies. With When they do that, um, I don't know what it's called, but they do it a lot in artistic 70s movies where they like to do like multiple faces swirling at once and then put like a really obnoxious instrumental over it and then that like misty gloss glaze look over the whole thing and 
there's a lot of like awkward cutaways and close-ups and <laughs> it's just it's a mess uh, so yeah there's a lot of that in there the thing that made it really gross though <laughs> was they put a lot of sexual content in that movie that was not in the book at all that was a hundred percent gratuitous and unnecessary and I needed a good scrub <laughs> afterwards because okay the um the first instance happens pretty much right off the bat you know the scene I told you about with uh, Amelia finding John McBurney in the woods and everything there is a line in the book where Amelia and John are are sitting in the woods because um, John at first isn't sure that he has enough strength to get up and move. So he's talking to her for a while trying to like motivate himself to try to stand up. And he asks her what her age is and she says, you know, 12, 13. I think she's 12 in the book and then they bump it up to 13 in the movie, I think. But she tells him and John makes the comment, oh, old enough for kisses. But in the book, the way it's written, it's kind of like, it's not meant to be dirty, um, the way it's written in the dialogue. It's kind of like when you, when you see like young girls who get crushes on older guys and the older guys are aware of it and they kind of innocently play it off like, oh, and you know, when you... See, I'm having trouble describing that because I feel like the world is really sensitive now. Um, <clears throat> but uh, there, there are instances where guys don't mean anything by it. They just, you know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, I think back to when I was a kid and uh, there was this guy that worked for the sheriff's department in my town who was in his early 20s and all of the little girls in town thought he was so cute and they were all like I'm gonna marry him you know the way little girls do innocently and he always made um, kind of deflecting offhanded comments about it because you know obviously he wasn't gonna be weird about it and, and be like you know, child bride and pedophilia and all that. He he would make these comments kind of like, you know, oh, if you were only a little bit older and, you know, like they said in here, you know, oh, you're old enough for kisses and, oh, you're going to be a heartbreaker when you're a little bit older and that kind of thing. But it wasn't in a creepy way. It's like, I think you know when you hear it done in a creepy way <laughs> where you're like, okay, that's, that's a little gross. Um, and that's, the way it was written in the book is kind of the way Colin Farrell played it in the movie where um, Amelia was a younger girl and he would give her like an innocent wink once in a while or say a comment of like, oh, you flirt. And then he would let it go and he would go back to talking to adults. In the 1970s version with Eastwood, he took it way, way too far, uh, in my opinion, because uh, they, they do that line that is said in the book because like I said, in the book, it's also it's said and then they move on. They don't, he doesn't, advance towards the girl in in the book story uh he doesn't make he doesn't lunge at her or anything he just makes the comment offhanded and then they go on and talk about other things uh in the movie version with eastwood he says it and then he rams his tongue down this child's throat <laughs> and barry and i both audibly yelled and threw ourselves back because she is very visibly a child in the movie and this is a grown man who just rammed his tongue down her throat. And it's explained in the movie that, oh, these soldiers are coming and they have to hide their location. And I'm just thinking, like, if that was the case, just cover her mouth real quick and say, shh, like, you know, what the... the. <laughs> so I thought that was going to be the worst of it. <laughs> um, but nope, um, in the first 15 minutes... The 1970s version has covered the topics of pedophilia and incest <laughs> in different forms. Uh-huh. 
asked you never to speak of my brother. Sorry, Miss Moth, I didn't mean nothing. The night shirt we call Master Miles to me. Surprising you didn't you too. Surprising you would bring the shank into your house too. Him being a man and all. I didn't want to. which was not brought up in the book. And then there's also one scene in the in the movie where they do like that misty transition thing I'm talking about where it's like looks like a dream sequence and like smack in the middle of that is a menage a trois scene and I was like that definitely wasn't in the book like what what is all this and Barry kept looking at me like what did you have what did you read what did, I'm like this is not in the book <laughs> it's like I almost felt guilty about it because he didn't know he was signing up for that I didn't know and I felt guilty for exposing him because he was just like I thought we were gonna sit down to an innocent civil war movie and yeah it was just it was a hard time Then what about later on tonight, when everybody's asleep? What about it? Hmm, I just happen to have a room to myself in the attic. Can you walk upstairs? I suppose I could, but I couldn't walk through a locked door. Oh, I forgot about that. I just thought I'd pay our guest a little visit. He wanted to know what class you were teaching. And I told him etiquette and uh, how to behave like a lady under all circumstances. All that anger in those pretty green eyes. I told you before, I don't trust any man. Did you ask her if she looks upon you as a Billy Yank enemy? Or if she's waiting for a prince to awaken her with a kiss. Now, oh, come on, that's nonsense. She doesn't mean anything to me. Just passing time, talking about her. That's Same all. as my father said to my mother. They mean nothing to me. I was only amusing myself. Oh, so your father was the man. No, no, Johnny. I know how I feel. Feel the same way and just tell know me. how I feel. When the war is over, I'll come back and get you. Please, Johnny, don't say that unless you mean it. You know I mean it. So, well, yeah, it's pretty pretty gross. Just to just name a few. There are other scenes in there that are just full on gratuitous booby shots, so I don't know, some of you might watch this and be like, oh, well, let me go look that up. <laughs> uh, but yeah, most of you, you probably get, if you get into it, you're probably going to need to scrub. But I took one for the team, so now you know. So you were saying how close that was to the, yeah, that, uh, that was, that was, um, how do yeah, I say, true. how do I say that? That was creative interpretation. Um, yeah, a lot of that wasn't in there at all. Well, I haven't read the book, but between that and the other movie, um, they seem like totally different movies, just about. Yeah. I mean, well, there were the the baseline was the same, but I, it was different. And big thing between this one and that one is you could actually see this. Yeah, this one had lighting. <laughs> and the other um, one was pretty much dark the whole time. Yeah, because apparently Sofia Coppola was under the impression that people didn't have more than one lamp per room. Yeah, with <laughs> in one those little days. flame. Yeah. That's all um, they had. I was like, why is everything so dark? 
Yeah, it was hard um, to watch that movie. So because. now in this one, the the lights were on, <laughs> but everybody's nipples were out. Yeah. Like everybody's nipples were out. And that certainly wasn't in the book. Um, yeah. And, yeah. And there was, there was hints of, um, yeah, of, you know, making out with a 12-year-old. Yeah. And that was, Brother and sister yeah, getting kind of friendly. Yeah, well, like, the first 15 <laughs> minutes, we've already tagged pedophilia and incest. Yeah. Um, yeah, again, don't remember that part in the book. I might have blanked it out, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure I don't remember reading that. I don't remember the um, other one. Yeah, yeah. No. Uh, so... Mm -hmm. That was weird. Uh, yeah. Weird. Um, yeah. I I I can see why this is one in Clint Eastwood's catalog that people probably skip over, <laughs> even though in like the notes it said it was, it served as sort of a bridge between his westerns and his cop movies. Well, I it, I think that's kind of what they're trying to do is trying to make the bridge, trying to make him more of a serious actor instead of. You know, just going around shooting people off of horses. Yeah, but... That's... I don't know if having your first scene with a 12-year-old and saying, <laughs> you're old enough for kisses. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if that's the way to go. No, no. Because when that scene came up, we were both like, whoa! Yeah. Whoa! No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, that was... No. That, um, was that was uncalled for. Yeah. <laughs> so... There was other ways of keeping her from not saying anything. Yeah, this one was a weird one. I don't know, like, I... There must have just been something off about the story altogether. I think it was kind of an interesting concept for a thriller, but yeah. the book was really slow for me, and the, um, Sofia Coppola's interpretation... You know, as much as I'm down to watch Colin Farrell on screen, like, any time... Well, you couldn't see him, though. Yeah. He <laughs> uh, was on the, screen, oh, but you didn't notice. So, yeah, that one wasn't my favorite. And then, oh, you also... I don't think we had a clip of it. Um, but you also mentioned when we were watching the first one... Um, when the, the the mountain boy thing and you remember when that scene where it comes up where Nicole oh. Kidman's she's she's um, trying to uh, trying to harvest dead corn yeah and you're like uh, I don't know why she's working so hard that's feed corn yeah <laughs> it's like they're not gonna eat that no, are they? no. I mean, <laughs> that that was way past the point of human consumption that, yeah. it, it was feed corn. And, <laughs> Yeah. That, that was his initial reaction to the movie starting like why is she hoeing so hard at some feed corn <laughs> like, uh, I don't know like their mules had to eat too I guess well, yeah. I, uh, I mean I have no problem with feeding livestock I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's like, an important thing to do I just thought it was funny it's like that's what you're taking away from this like well it is that's feed corn it is. Yeah. Um, but yeah that was, that was the beguiled uh, I will say though, uh, we ended up watching it on DVD because obviously it's back in the 70s. It's kind of hard to find that on streaming or anything. So I found a copy of it on um, uh, Amazon. But yeah, um, on the DVD, the thing that actually caught our interest was there is a, a lot of interesting behind the scenes footage, or not footage, but like information um, where they interviewed <coughs> some of the people that were involved in that project and um, it turns out there's there's also some sad history behind the movie. Um, so yeah, learning about all of that was interesting. It's just the movie itself. I was kind of like, nah. Is there that part that says, uh, Don Siegel called the resultant film a combination of Ambrose Bierce Edgar Allan Poe, Tennessee Williams, and Truman Capote. They're awfully proud of this thing. They are. Goodness. I could see some of the Truman Capote in there. <laughs> the Beguiled is a woman's picture. That's right. A lot of boobies in here for a woman's picture, but okay.
not a picture for women, but about <laughs> women. Okay, we'll just see. Watch any murder, anything. <laughs> wow. Wow, that's good. Behind that mask of innocence lurks as much evil as you'll find in members of the Mafia. Any young girl who is who looks perfectly harmless is capable of murder. Damn. Hmm. Uh, but I, I think I have some clips of the behind the scenes stuff too. If you want to know some of that history, I'll insert it here. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much all I have for this one. <laughs> so um, thanks for watching and I'll be back soon with a not so scrub worthy movie to talk about. <laughs> thanks guys. We'll talk soon. Bye. Oh. Yeah.